having priests offer sacrifices. So that dates the book. And then if you go over to chapter 13, verse 23, I think it is, uh, the writer talks about Timothy. He's soon released. And if, if I'm released, I will join him with you. So uh, as Dwayne said, I believe that that really shows that Paul is a writer of this, although it's not spoken anywhere in this book. And so it uh, goes on to say in verse uh, 5, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was also admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Some people don't understand this, but when Moses was on the mountain and in communion with God, he literally saw into heaven and the tabernacle and then later Solomon's temple was actually a representation or a recreation of what exists in heaven. There is a physical temple in heaven and he saw it. And that's what this is referring to, that you make sure that you create this tabernacle so that it reflects what you saw in the mount. And in verse 6, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry of how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Again, man, we just skip over these things and don't think about it. But did you know this was written to the Jews? That's the reason it's called Hebrews. And this was radical. This was radical. This is why he was in prison. This is why he was beaten. This is why terrible things happened to him because man, the Jews of those days were totally locked into the Old Testament and the priesthood and the seventh chapter, which Dwayne just kind of referenced. He didn't go into great detail, but it says there that Jesus is now a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And it was quoting from Psalms 110 verse four, where it says, I have sworn and will not repent that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So God not only changed the priesthood, but he swore that he would never repent this was so offensive to the Jews because everything was based on the Levitical priesthood and the things that had been shared up to this point were just radical, radical things that I mean the Jews just could not accept. And it's amazing how Christians are still locked into the old covenant way of doing things. You may not have a priest as such that is doing things, but it's like we still have the same mentality. The law, and man, I'm, this is a huge statement that I hadn't got time to defend, but the law wasn't sin. It says that in Romans chapter 7, but it is sin for a New Testament believer to try and serve God under the law is what it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, and uh, it's either verse 10 or 11, that the law is not of faith. And you put that together with Romans 14, 23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It's law for a, it's sin for a Christian to try and serve God under the Old Testament law mentality. And did you know that that's offensive, I'm sure, to a lot of people right here in this room. I don't mean to be, but I'm just saying what the word says. And this is what Paul or the writer of Hebrews was saying. And this was super offensive to people. And sad to say, most Christians have never made a clear break from the old covenant way of serving the Lord. The law wasn't given to set you free. The law was given to bind you. I could quote right now a dozen scriptures about the law ministered death. The law ministered condemnation. The law uh, made sin come alive on the inside of you. It's the strength of sin, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Those are all scriptures that I quoted. And yet most people think the law was something good. Well, it was good in the sense that it showed you your sin. And it showed you that God is perfect and that you aren't. And it knocked you down. It beat you down. It condemned you. It ministered death so that you would quit trusting in your goodness and thinking that you could do something to make yourself uh, acceptable to the Lord. And so in that sense, it was good because it revealed your sin to you, but it could never change you. The law never changes anybody. All it does is point out what you've done wrong. The gospel came along and changed you. It not only showed you what was wrong, but it gave you an answer through Jesus 
And now we aren't even supposed to be sin conscious anymore. Man, that's, that's a lot that I said right there and I hadn't got time to defend it. Let me say this. In verse six again, let me read this. It says, he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, more excellent than the law. Again, this just infuriated the Jews. By how much he is made the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Again, people think, no, this is heresy. This isn't saying the old covenant was wrong. It was perfect at the time. But it is wrong for us with a better covenant. Man, I wish I just, I wish I could just download everything that God has shown me into you somehow. That's what our tapes and books and materials are for. I can't say all of these things, but God loves us more than we have ever understood. Most of us do not have a full revelation of God's love for us. Let me rephrase that. Nobody in here has a full revelation. We're still in the process of learning. And the number one hindrance to us fully understanding God's great love. Like when we were singing that song, I am a child of God. Did you know they couldn't sing that in the old covenant? They may have had a relationship with God to a degree, but to say that you are a child of God and call God your father, that was unheard of. This is the reason that they even tried to cr uh, crucify Jesus. They said he called God his father, making himself equal with God. And the Jews wanted to kill him. That was a concept that was unknown in the old covenant. God wasn't father. He was God. Today, we are a child of God. We call him father. And the Lord said, our father, which art in heaven, that was blasphemy to the Jews. We take so much stuff for granted. The old covenant did not bring us close to God. It showed us the wrath of God and in a sense drove us to bow the knee. But the new covenant is just completely different. And this is what he's talking about. It's a better covenant established upon better uh, promises. And look at this in verse seven, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Again, can you imagine how this must have affected the Jews to say that the law had fault in it? <laughs> Boy, they just were livid. And then in verse eight, for finding fault with them, he saith, and it begins to quote Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. So this was prophesied in the old covenant. The old covenant wasn't wrong. It was just temporary until Jesus could come. That's what it says in Galatians chapter three, that the law was our schoolmaster until Christ should come. It wasn't wrong. It was just temporary and it brought us to Christ, but the old covenant even prophesied the end of the old covenant and the beginning of a better covenant. And right here in Jeremiah chapter 31 is where he's quoting is one of those major prophecies. It says, for finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I brought, uh, took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not. The thing that was wrong with the old covenant, it wasn't anything wrong with it. It was perfect. The problem was we weren't perfect. Imperfect people can't live under a perfect covenant. And so we wound up breaking it and therefore we could never really benefit from it. So God made a new covenant that isn't based on your performance. It's based on what Jesus did for you. And all you have to do is access that covenant by faith, not by performance. The old covenant was all based on your performance. The new covenant is based on Jesus' performance. And all you have to do is believe and receive, or if you doubt, you do without. In verse uh, 10, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Again, I could spend a huge amount of times on each one of these verses, but the old covenant restrained you from outside, fear of punishment, and it was telling you what to do, and it restrained your actions. 
Man, there's so many scriptures I could quote. Oh, the old covenant actually put fear on the inside of you and it drove people to serve God by fear. The new covenant, in contrast, releases the love of God on the inside of you and it flows out of you. It's a fruit. It's a byproduct of a relationship with God. Your holiness is. It's not something you do in order to obtain relationship. And this is what that verse is talking about, that he's now going to put the law of God on the inside of us and it'll be written on your heart. And it says in verse 11, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Did you know many people interpret this as every single Jew is ultimately going to be saved, that they will all know me from the least to the greatest. This isn't talking about this. This is talking about the new covenant that every person in the new covenant will know God personally, that they will have God speak to them and they will all know him. A true Christian isn't a person who's just heard some doctrines and has embraced those doctrines and you have a mental assent to what truth is, but a true born again Christian is a person who's been changed on the inside. God lives on the inside of you and now you have God literally revealing himself to you. There is no such thing as grandchildren in the body of Christ. Every person has to have their own personal relationship with the Lord. And that's what this is talking about, that they will all know him from the least to the great, great, uh, greatest. And then this verse 12, this has to be one of the most amazing scriptures in the Bible. And yet very few Christians live this way. He says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Amen. Did you know the church basically is preaching that God is angry with you? I've actually had people stand up in churches that I've been in before and say, God is angry. God is upset with you. Besides that, <laughs> this person was prophesying and he was saying in the name of the Lord, I'm angry, I'm upset. And besides that, I am not here. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> but there are people that are just imputing people's sins unto them. Under the new covenant, your sins are imputed to Jesus, not to you. God is merciful to you and your unrighteousness he will remember no more. Man, that's good news. If I can talk fast enough, I'm trying to get over into this ninth chapter, but man, this is just phenomenal. And in verse 13, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Did you know that the phrase vanish away right here, it, it means to disannul. Matter of fact, the word disannul is used over in the seventh chapter. I didn't read that verse, but it just means to completely nullify as if it never happened. My little layman's definition of the word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. That's what justified is. God has disannulled. He is merciful to your unrighteous. God isn't imputing sin unto you. Those of us that are in Christ, God doesn't even remember your sins. He's not holding sins against you. That's nearly too good to be true. Boy, this raises all kinds of questions that I'm, I don't want to get sidetracked trying to answer them. But this is not saying that it's okay for you to go live in sin. Because if you live in sin, God is going to still love you the same, but you won't love God the same. Satan will use that sin to blind you, to harden your heart. It's also an inroad of the devil into your life. And the Bible says in John 10, 10, that the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If you yield yourself to Satan, you are going to have Satan come in and bring depression, sickness, poverty, and all kinds of things. It's not God that's doing it. It's you opening the door to the devil. But God isn't holding your sins against you. So we still need to live holy, but not in order to be accepted with God, but it's to shut the door on the devil to keep our hearts sensitive to God. It is not to earn God's favor. And then I mentioned this quickly uh, the very first night, but in the ninth chapter, the first five verses, he's summarizing that in the temple, there were these uh, elements of service to God and the, the uh, showbread and the uh, 
sat at the altar and all these things. And then it talks about the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant and over it in verse five, shadowing the mercy seat were these cherubs. And it says, we can't talk about the cherubs particularly now. What he was talking about is these cherubs were in the Holy of Holies and they overshadowed the Ark of the Covenant. And God said that's where he would dwell and he would speak to them from off the, uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubs. And if anybody tried to enter into the Holy of Holies except the high priest once a year, they would be struck dead by these cherubs. So this is the reason it says we can't talk about them now because we now have a new and living way. If you were here the very first night, I ministered on this out of chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, that we now have boldness to enter into the very Holy of Holies and the veil of the temple, which was the body of Christ, is broken for us. It's been torn in two so that there is now no longer any separation between us and God because Jesus took our sins. And those angels before Jesus died were there to kill anybody who tried to enter into the temple. Now we can't talk about these angels because the way is now made open. Satan, I mean, uh, the cherubs aren't there to stop us from coming into God. If you were to have an angel try and block your access to God, you could rebuke him in the name of Jesus. You've got direct access. The veil has been rent in twain. In verse 6, it says, Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made per, uh, manifest, while as the first tabernacle was standing. So again, this is saying that that veil that separated us from going into the very presence of God was a testimony that God was separated from man. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 says that his, our sins have separated us from God. And under the old covenant, there was this constant separation. You couldn't have this intimacy with the Lord. Today in the new covenant, we have access right into the holy of holies and we should not have this sin consciousness, but we do because of the law. The law works condemnation is what it says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses, verse 9. And the Bible says in the new covenant, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them. If you feel condemned, and you know, condemned is a word that to many people is just a religious word, but it means unfit for use. Like if you condemn a building, you say this building is not fit for use. And so they'll condemn it. And nobody can go in. If you feel unfit for use, it's because you're under the law. Amen. Thank you for that one. Amen. <laughs> Most people are thinking, well, no, I am condemned. I have done this wrong. Well, you aren't understanding that Jesus paid for all of your sins, past, present, and even the ones you haven't committed yet. So I'm trying to get down to these verses. Let me continue reading. In verse 9, it says, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. I've got an entire book written on the conscience that's entitled, Who Told You That You Were Naked? And that's really about your conscience is what that is. And most Christians do not have a clear conscience. Down here in chapter 10, verse 2, it says you should have no more conscience of sin. And then in uh, Hebrews 9, 11, it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is one of the most radical statements in the Bible. And again, most Christians don't understand this. The average Christian believes that when you get born again and when you receive Jesus as your Savior, that you are cleansed of all of your sin that you committed in the past. But every time you sin from that time on, you've got to get that sin confessed and under the blood or 
the Pentecostals will say you lose your salvation and if you die with an unconfessed sin in your life, you'd go to hell, even though you might have been walking with the Lord for 40 years. But if you did something wrong and died in a car wreck before you had time to confess it, you'd die and go to hell because you can't have any unconfessed sin in your life. Every sin after you get born again has to be atoned for again and put under the blood. That's one extreme of the same thing. It's like a stick that has two opposite ends on it. It's the same stick, just the opposite end, a lesser consequence. The evangelicals will say, no, you don't lose your salvation when you sin, but you'll lose the benefits. You can't fellowship with God. God won't answer your prayer with an unconfessed sin in your life or something like that. This is saying, if words mean anything, this says that by his own blood, he entered in once, once, once into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption, not redemption until the next time you sin, but eternal redemption. And somebody's thinking, how can God forgive us sin before you commit it? Dwayne mentioned this last night, but all of your sins were in the future. When Jesus died, he only died once. He only entered into the temple once and put the blood on the altar. All of our sins were in the future. If God can't forgive a future sin, you and I can't be saved. He died for the sin of the whole world once. And you know that there's five times that the word once is mentioned in Hebrews chapter nine. It's also mentioned over here in chapter seven Verse 27, it says, who, uh, talking of Jesus, who needeth not daily uh, as those high priests offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's sins. For this he did once when he offered up himself. If you read this and study it, this once is a major, major point about Jesus and it's contrasting the way things were done under the old covenant. In the old covenant, every time you sinned, you had to offer a sacrifice for that sin and get that sin under the blood because the blood of animals never really cleansed anybody. It was only symbolic. And so you had to keep repeating the symbolism. But Jesus wasn't symbolic. He was the real deal. And when he died for your sins, he paid for all of the sins of the entire world, past, present, and even future sins. Man, that's awesome. Now somebody's thinking, so are you saying that people that don't accept Jesus have their sins forgiven? Well, they've had the blood shed for their sins. Their sins have been paid for, but it says in Romans chapter five, verse two, that we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So you don't automatically have what Jesus paid for you work. You have to confess him as your Lord and you have to access that grace by faith. But for every person who's ever been born again and made Jesus their Lord, all of your sins have already been atoned for. And there is nothing separating you from God. The only thing that is separating you from God is your conscience, which is aggravated and amplified through the law that condemns you. That's radical. I've been branded a cult so many times for saying these things. It goes on to say in verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats is in the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Did you know Jesus has already purged your sins? Now the per thing you got to do is purge your conscience. I dealt with that the first night over in Hebrews chapter 10, where it talks about that we have to enter with a full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. God has already cleansed you, but not everybody knows that we're cleansed and they're still bearing about a sin consciousness and they aren't entering boldly into the presence of God because of they're aware of their unworthiness, which is amplified through the law. That was the purpose of the law. Still living under the law. In the next verse, it says, and for this cause, he, speaking of Jesus, is a mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions, that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 
Verse 12 says we have eternal redemption. Verse 15 says we have eternal inheritance. What part of eternal do we not understand? And yet the average Christian is, no, I believe I'm saved until I sin again. And then if I sin, either the Pentecostals, you lose your salvation and you got to get born again, again, or the evangelicals, you don't lose your salvation, but you lose all the benefits. God won't fellowship with you. He's not pleased with you. He's dealing with you based on your sin. Man, I got so much I'd love to say. I've got a book entitled Spirit, Soul, and Body that if you've never read that, you need to read it because God is a spirit and God is dealing with you based on who you are in the spirit. And in the spirit, you're a brand new person and you are holy and pure. You, uh, Ephesians chapter four, verse 24, you were created in righteousness and true holiness. That's not talking about your body. It's not talking about your mind, your mental, emotional part. It's talking about your spirit. Your spirit is completely brand new. And according to 1 John 4, 17, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. That's not talking about your body. We got to get a new body. It's not talking about your mind. We're going to have to get our mind renewed and we'll know all things even as also we're known. But in your spirit, you were born again and you are as righteous and holy and pure as Jesus is. Amen. Amen. And because God is a spirit, he's looking at you in the spirit and he's not imputing any sin unto you. You've been cleansed of all sin, past, present, and future. You got eternal redemption and eternal inheritance. And God just thinks you're awesome. Like Dwayne said, you're a trophy wife. First time I'd ever heard that. But you know what? God thinks you're awesome because it says in Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, by, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, wherein too he's ordained that you should walk in them. You are the workmanship of Christ, not in your physical body. This physical body's got to change. You get a glorified body. Not in your mind. We're in the process of renewing it, but it's not perfect yet. But in your spirit, you're as saved and perfect right now as you will ever be in eternity. And there is no law. There is no sin. There is no restriction. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, Once you believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That means that you were vacuum packed. The Holy Spirit encased your spirit and that spirit that was Ephesians 4, 24 created in righteousness and true holiness is instantly uh, vacuum packed, sanctified and no sin penetrates that barrier. Your spirit never changes once you get born again. Your body can change if you oh, go out and live in sin. You can affect your body and get sick and do things. Your mind and emotions can change, but your spirit, the part of you that's in relationship with God is perfect and pure and it never changes. You have eternal redemption. Man, this changed my life and I've got to skip. Man, these other verses are awesome. Five times in the ninth chapter, it says once, once Jesus entered in, once Jesus, it just says it over and over and over. It's contrasting the Old Testament. Every time you sinned, you had to have a, a new sacrifice to get you back in fellowship with God. In the New Testament, one sacrifice forever gained you access to God. As I was talking about, it says in Hebrews chapter 10 that the veil was his body and it was rent in two from the top to the bottom. The religious concept that most people have is that every time you sin, that veil gets put back together and then you got to get it confessed and then again, it's rent and you can, you're in and out of the holy place. But that's not what the word of God pictures. Man, I wish I had time to read all of that. In chapter 10, verse one, it says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. If you were here yesterday, I, I talked about the shadow and this terminology is used five or six times right here in this context that the law was a shadow. A shadow isn't the real deal. It's just something that gives you an indication, a picture, a type and a shadow of what's to come. The law was a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? 
There's a question mark there. What's the answer? If the, if the sacrifices could have really worked, they'd have quit offering them. The very fact that they offered them over and over showed you that they didn't work. They were only symbols. They were types and shadows. And that's the reason that you had to be constantly cleansed over and over. But the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus did work. And because of it, you don't have to be cleansed over and over and over and over and over and over. It goes on to say in the rest of that second verse, it says, because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Man, that's not even something that most Christians think is positive. Most Christians think going around feeling unworthy and I'm an old sinner saved by grace, that that is a godly way of living. It's not. We have been separated from the presence of God because we haven't been freed from the Old Testament law which just focused on your sin. In Romans chapter 3, it says, verse 19, that the law is, it, it made, uh, gave us a knowledge of sin is the purpose of the law. It focused your attention on all of your failures and most of us have lived under the law and we still have this law mentality where we're focused on the outside and all of our failures instead of the inside, what happened to us at salvation. Again, somebody's thinking, well, man, if you were to do what you're talking about, people would just go live in sin. It's the opposite. If you were to ever understand who you are and how holy and how pure you are, if you ever got hold of what Jesus has done for you and if you ever entered into the holy of holies and truly connected with God, you would live holier accidentally than you've ever lived on purpose before. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you really understood how pure and how holy what Jesus has done for you, you would protect it, you would reflect it, you would live a holy life. A person who is living in sin is a person who, that, they think that that's their nature. They think that's who they are. Man, I hadn't got time to teach on this, but you know, Romans chapter six squashes this whole thing about you having two natures. You've only got one nature now. You had a nature that was bound to the devil, but you got born again and you got a brand new nature. And if you would crawl out from under the law and ever enter into the holy place and fellowship with God, it would start dominating and controlling you. As you think in your heart, that's the way that you are. The reason most people are, are defeated is because they see themselves defeated. They think that's who they are. Man, I've got to skip some other great verses here, but let me go down to verse 10. It says, it's talking about that Jesus died and put a will into effect and then he rose from the dead to enforce his own will. <laughs> the only person who ever did that. You know, a will doesn't go into effect until a person's dead, but then you don't know for sure if they're going to enforce it right. Well, Jesus died and then rose from the dead so he could enforce his will according to his, what he wanted. And so in verse 10, it says, by the which will we are sanctified. The word sanctified means to make holy or to set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Again, this goes back to what was said in the seventh chapter, verse 27, in the ninth chapter, five different times that the Old Testament priests offered sacrifices every time you sinned, but in the new covenant, one offering for sin gave you eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. And now it says that we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I've had some people say, well, that doesn't mean once for all time. That means once for all people. Well, keep reading. Look at the context. In verse 11, it says, and every priest, it's making a contrast with the way it was done under the law versus the way it's done under the new covenant. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But the word but is a contrast. It's it's contrasting the way it was done under the old covenant with the new covenant. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, not just for all people, but forever, for all time. 
one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. And, you know, this is another thing. If he, if he had to atone for your sins every time you mess up and then you confess it and you got to get it back under the blood, there'd be no such thing as him sitting down. <laughs> you know, we got billions, at least hundreds of millions of Christians around the world. And did you know that the average Christian confesses sins at least once a day? <laughs> Amen. That would be hundreds of millions of sins being confessed and Jesus constantly having to reply his blood. He'd never sit down. But now he's seated. That means that it's over. His job is done. When he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. Man, it's finished. It's over. Jesus isn't having to forgive you over and over and over every time you blow it. You know, my sister, Joyce, she's now gone on to be with the Lord, but she was nine years older than me, and she had a daughter that was bad news. She's got two daughters that just turned out awesome, and man, they are loving God and serving God and doing great things, having hundreds of people come to their meetings and stuff. But this first daughter, she could try anybody's patience. And anyway, she, Joyce was trying to fix Supper, my, her husband was coming home, bringing somebody from uh, Oklahoma Baptist University home. He was a professor and bringing them home uh, to eat. And so Joyce was busy fixing food and stuff. And this, this daughter just got on her last nerve, <laughs> man. And she got the mouth and off and Joyce just hauled off and hit her and knocked her on the floor. And my sister, she loved God. She saw people raised from the dead. She went to the jail every single week, led people to the Lord. She loved the Lord. She knew better than this. It just, you know, was a flesh flash and she made a mistake. And so anyway, she ran upstairs, threw herself across the bed and started. And she says, God, if I start crying, I won't come out of here until tomorrow morning. I've got supper to fix and all these things. I've got to have help. And the Lord spoke to her and he said, Joyce, when you were eight years old and you asked me into your life, I knew you'd do this and I've already forgiven you of it. And you know, that didn't free her up to go down and slap her daughter again because after all, she's forgiven. No, but it freed her up to go down and say, I'm sorry and repentance and put things back. See, if you understand that God has forgiven you, you won't be, Satan won't devastate you. He won't condemn you and overwhelm you. This says it, that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. In verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 10 says you're sanctified by one offering once for all. And verse 14 says if you've been sanctified, you are perfected forever. Most people struggle with this because they go look in the mirror and they think this is perfect. And they see gray hairs and wrinkles and zits and ugly and they think this is perfect. No, your body's not perfect. And then they'll search their mind and emotions and they know that they don't always think right and do things right. And most people are carnally minded. They can only see and feel things. They don't know what they're like in the spirit. But in the spirit is the part of you that was saved and it is sanctified and perfected forever. I can prove that to you in chapter 12. If you'll turn over to chapter 12 and in verse 22, it says, but you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of just man made perfect. Hebrews 10, 14 says, if you've been sanctified, you've been perfected forever, not just until the next time you sin, but perfected forever. What part of you is perfected forever? This says to the spirits of just man made perfect. It's your spirit that got born again. Your body's not born again. Your mind's not born again. Your spirit is the only part of you that is truly saved. The rest of the Christian life is learning how to bring your mind, your thoughts, and your actions under the control of who you are in the spirit. 
But in the spirit, you have been sanctified and perfected forever. Not just until the next time you sin. Man, this raises some great questions which I hadn't got time to answer. <laughs> Man. I don't know. I'm not going to back down on what I've said because all I've been doing is quoting scripture. But I know that there are people that have questions like, what about 1 John 1, 9? Oh, man, I wish I had time to minister on 1 John. <laughs> I'm just standing on the fact that I am sanctified and perfected forever. My spirit that was made perfect is sealed by the Holy Spirit. And sin can't penetrate that barrier. So even when I sin, it doesn't affect my spirit since God is a spirit and I have to worship him in spirit and in truth, then I can come boldly, Hebrews 4, 16, under the throne of grace that I may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Not just when everything's going good. But even when I've blown it, I can still come boldly before God if I worship him in spirit and in truth. If I come before God and say, oh God, I've failed and I did this again and I start talking about all of this and because of it, I just can't understand why God would love me, then I'm in, not in the spirit. I'm in the flesh. I'm approaching God in the flesh. Man, this is where most people live. Most people live in the flesh. They approach God on the basis of how holy they've been living, how much they've been studying the word, whether or not they've got mad at somebody, whether or not they've done everything, and they just live with a sin consciousness. Again, this says we should have no more conscience of sin. How much more will the blood of Jesus Christ purge your conscience from dead works so that you can serve the living God? You should be able to enter into the presence of God and instead of bowing and scraping and ducking like he's going to hit you and, oh God, please don't hit me, you enter boldly and jump in his lap and say, Abba, Father. Now, you still reverence God. I still have a reverence for God. I am overwhelmed at how God could love somebody like me. I'm not ignorant of my flesh. I'm not ignorant of the fact that I'm ignorant. Amen. <laughs> that I don't know all things. I'm aware of my physical body and my mental uh, lapse and things like this, but I approach God in spirit and in truth. And God is a spirit and he looks at me in the spirit and God is pleased with me. Amen. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, part of that verse, last part, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Faith is what pleases God, not your performance. Your performance is a reflection of your faith, but it's not a perfect reflection. But if you truly understood things, you would wind up living holy, but faith is what pleases God. I ministered in, uh, in uh, Kansas, and I went to a church, and there was about three, 400 people in the Sunday morning church service and I started by saying, how many of you want to please God more than anything else? And nearly every hand in the auditorium went up. And I said, that's good. How many of you now believe that you do please God? And did you know out of three or 400, there was two hands went up, a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old <laughs> that believed that they pleased God. And then I started, now this is a major problem. If this is your goal in life is to please God and yet you don't believe you do it, well, then that right there is an occasion for condemnation, frustration, all kinds of things. And then I begin to teach them that it's not your actions that please God, it's your faith. If you've made Jesus your Lord, you got born again, you became a brand new person created in righteousness and true holiness, and you now please God because you have the spirit of Christ living on the inside of you. You are the righteousness of God in him. And if you were worshiping him in spirit and in truth, you would know that you do please God. Not because of your performance, but because of you accepting Jesus. Man, that's awesome. So anyway, these are some of the most important things that the Lord ever showed me is that, man, I am sanctified, cleansed, and perfected forever, not through what I do, but through what Jesus did for me. Man, that's awesome.
That's awesome. If I had time, I could answer 1 John 1, 9 and many other things. Uh, but anyway, I just encourage you to take these things and you study it. And, you know, you can get that living commentary. I've got all of the things that I should have said and didn't have time to say written in my living commentary. I encourage you to get it. It would be a blessing to you. Father, we love you and we thank you for these truths. Thank you for what Jesus has done. And Holy Spirit, we are asking you to give us supernatural revelation that people would understand what you've done for us. Father, take away our religious concepts that are still based in law and our performance and help us to just enter boldly into the holiest by a new and living way that you have consecrated for us through the veil, that is your flesh. Father, I pray that you open up our hearts and help us to receive this and we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. All right, what I'm going to do during this uh, week, I've got four sessions. Dwayne has three. When he grows up, we're going to let him have more sessions. <laughs> when he gets proven. But uh, I've got four sessions, and what I'm going to do is start sharing from the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to try and do a synopsis of the entire book. There's 13 chapters and I know that this isn't what most people typically want. Most people come and they are looking for a specific, like a healing. They want a touch from God. They're wanting, they're wanting to come and just have God touch them in some significant way. But they don't want to sit there and, and actually study the Word. And that's one of the big problems. Is that people are seeking a one-time thing. They're seeking something, but... The reason that people get into the problems that they're in is because they don't understand the truths of the Word of God. And I can say this, that if, you, if Hebrews isn't one of your favorite books, if this isn't something that man just causes you to rejoice, you do not understand the New Testament. You don't understand the true gospel. The book of Hebrews was written for multiple reasons, but the name says a lot because it is to transition the Jews from serving God under the old covenant mentality into the new covenant. And this is what it's all about. And yet most Christians today, and I dare to say you guys are the cream of the crop. This is a Thursday night. And so you've come out here to hear a hick from Texas. And uh, you have to be a fanatic or you were drugged here by a fanatic, one of the two. <laughs> So you're the cream of the crop, but I can guarantee you the majority of people right here in this room do not understand the fullness of the new covenant. They are still trying to serve God under an old covenant mentality. And you may say, that's not me. But as I go through this, these are some of the most radical things that God has ever spoken to me. And uh, as I get into Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10... I guarantee you there are things that when I started teaching them, I'd never heard anybody else teach it. I've since heard Pastor Dwayne and a couple of other people that also had the same thing. So I'm not claiming it's unique to me, but I'm saying it's not well known. And very, very, very few people understand the truths that are given in the book of Hebrews. And that's one of the reasons that they have so many problems. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 32. He says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you aren't free, and this is a huge statement, but I believe it and I believe I can back it up by scripture. If you aren't free in any area of your life, whether it's financial, whether it's your uh, physical body, uh, your healing, whether it's your emotions, if you are bound in any area, you do not know the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There's a difference in just nodding your head and saying, yes, I acknowledge the truth, but you haven't embraced it. It's not a part of you because when you get hold of the truth, the truth will set you free. And I, I don't back up on that any at all. And I know that I would say that probably the majority of people that are here are here because you have some need and you are looking to get that need meant tonight. And I understand that. I'm not saying that's 100% wrong. But if all you do is come and just want God to touch your body, to touch your finances, to have something happen. But if you don't change the way you think, 
you're going to have more problems. It's a systemic thing. And so many Christians are just looking for God to touch them, but they aren't looking to change their way of thinking. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. Anything you need comes through the knowledge of God. If you have a need in your life somewhere you don't understand things. You aren't believing properly or it would come to you. You don't have to beg God. God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. God wants you to be well more than you want to be well. He wants to prosper you more than you want to prosper. He wants to give you love, joy, and peace. Those things have already been done. If you aren't receiving it, it's not God who hasn't given. And so you got to beg more or go to a different meeting and have more people lay hands on you until they rub all the hair off the top of your head. What you need is more truth. You need to understand and get revelation knowledge of the Word of God. My people perish for a lack, or they're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but this is the reason that we have so many problems today. If all you do is think according to the Word of God, it says in Romans chapter 8, to be carnally minded is death. And carnally minded doesn't necessarily mean sinful minded, uh, things like that. All, car all sin is carnal, but did you know not all carnality is sin? Just thinking like a mere human. Just thinking like, you know, people will say, well, I'm just a man or a woman, what can I do? That's carnal thinking. You aren't just a man or a woman. One third of you, if you're born again, is wall to wall Holy Ghost. You have power and authority. And if you're just going around saying, well, you know, but the doctor told me I'm going to die. I've got cancer. What can I do? That's carnal. And the Bible says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, spiritually minded is word minded. John chapter 6, verse 63. Jesus said, it's the spirit that quickens, makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word is spirit. So to be spiritually minded is to be word minded. And so again, going back to Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded, word minded is life and peace. If you don't have life and peace, you aren't spiritually minded. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> I know some of you are, are thinking about, what are you saying? Are you saying it's my fault? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and in a way, that's a great blessing to find out that it's, it's my fault because if it's God's fault, if it's God that just ordained that you be a dud <laughs> and that you have sickness and that you are going to be poor and if, it's, if this is just the way it's going to be and so you're going to spend all of your time begging God to, oh, please touch me and change my life. If it's God's fault, how do you change God? Well, this is what religion teaches. You just pray and intercede fast. You twist God's arm and put pressure on him. And if he won't respond to you, then call the prayer chain and get a hundred people to pressure him. And this is basically what the body of Christ is doing. An easier way is to just know the truth and the truth will make you free. The truth will change you. And as you think in your heart, that's the way you will be. Proverbs 23, 7. Your life is going the direction of your thoughts, your dominant thoughts. I'm not saying it's going the direction of your desires. You may be praying for healing, desiring prosperity. You may desire all of these things, but your life is the way you think. Hey Amen. I got to get into the book of Hebrews. So again... Let me just summarize some things. I'm going to get to Hebrews chapter 10 is where I'm going to start because it says after uh, nine chapters of things, it was basically kind of making a summary of the things that were said. So in uh, Hebrews chapter one, it talks off that it starts by saying that God has spoken in times past through angels and through different ways. But now 
He speaks through Jesus. And that Jesus, Hebrews 1, 3, is the express image of the Father. That word, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it is literally taught, I mean, not Hebrew, but in the Greek, it's literally talking about he is a perfect representation, an exact representation. Before, he spoke in symbolism and in shadows and things in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we got the real deal. Jesus is the greatest way of speaking. And the rest of the first chapter goes along and talks about uh, how much Jesus is greater than the angels. And it contrasts the ministry of Jesus to the ministry of angels. Then in chapter 2, it talks about, therefore, we should give the more earnest heed to the things that have been spoken through Jesus. Because if the things spoken by angels in the Old Testament was punished and every transgression received a just recompense, well then how much more are we going to escape if we neglect what Jesus has done? And he's setting up, if you're paying attention, he's setting up that there is a difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. And Jesus has brought in a new covenant. Then in chapter 3, he starts talking about Jesus is the high priest of our profession and he starts making a major deal out of Jesus being superior to Moses because Jesus is the one who built the house, whereas Moses was just faithful over the house that God gave him. But Jesus is the one who built it. And then in chapter 4, one, I'm going to come back to this hopefully sometime during this week because Hebrews chapter 4 is one of the most uh, important things that the Lord ever showed me about how you rest in what Jesus has done instead of you trying to do something to get Jesus to move. And brothers and sisters, this is the majority of the body of Christ is working and striving, trying to get God to do something instead of trusting what Jesus has already provided. So that's what the fourth chapter is about. And then in chapter five, it takes up the high priesthood of Jesus again and starts talking about it. But he says at the end of chapter 5, he says, I've got a lot of things to say to you, but you can't bear it because you're carnal. And then in chapter 6, he takes a brief uh, sideline saying, you need to get away from just being a baby Christian. You need to get over the basics and you need to start getting into some serious meat and start understanding the things of God. And again, I'm not saying this to criticize anybody, but brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the body of Christ does not want to study the Word. They don't want to renew their mind. They want somebody to wave their hand over them. They want to come to church and have somebody just pray and solve their problems so that they can go back to being carnal. It doesn't work that way. And this, the sixth chapter is a rebuke in talking about how we need to press in and get hold, lay hold on the... Uh, promises given unto us. They act like an anchor of the soul. Then the seventh chapter is where he really gets into contrasting the ministry of Jesus with the Old Testament ministry. And Jesus wasn't a priest that came out of Levi, which was what was demanded under the law. He was a priest after Melchizedek. That's one of Charlie's favorite passages of scripture. <laughs> Charlie LeBlanc, the one that's leading the praise and worship. I was teaching on this over in... Uh, England, probably 20 years ago, and I was teaching on Hebrews 7, and I said, are you getting this? And Charlie goes, no, real loud. I'm going to try and make it a little bit more engaging as we get to the seventh chapter, but that is a powerful truth that said, if the priesthood is changed, then there's got to be a change in the law. Did you know that that's such a radical statement? To say that you're changing the law, the Jews of this day would have rebelled because the law was everything. And yet he says there's got to be a change in the law. And then in the eighth chapter, he starts quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31, where he says, I'm going to make a new covenant. And it's going to be completely different. And one of the benefits of it, I think it's in verse 12, is that your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Radical statement, radical statement. And the average Christian does not understand this. The average Christian only believes that your sins are forgiven up until the time you get born again. And then every sin that you commit thereafter, you got to get it confessed and under the blood. And if you don't, God won't, it, it depends. There's the Pentecostals that say you lose your salvation every time you sin and you got to be born again again. Or 
the evangelicals, it's the same principle, but just less consequence. You don't lose your salvation. You're just going to lose the benefits of your salvation. He won't fellowship with you. He won't answer your prayer if there's any sin in your life. If I really believe that, I'd be doing you a favor to kill you the moment you get saved. <laughs> That's the only way you'd ever get every sin totally confessed and stuff like that. And so that's what the eighth chapter promises. And then the ninth chapter comes along. And this is one of the things that I'll share with you that this revolutionized my life. But it says in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 12, that you, one sacrifice of Jesus gave you eternal redemption. Not redemption until the next time you sin. Eternal redemption. Past, present, and even future sins have been forgiven. And then Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 says you have eternal inheritance. And again, there's a large sex section of the body of Christ that thinks that you lose your salvation every time you sin. And they got to be born again again. That's bondage. That's terrible. Then the 10th chapter just amplifies on this. And in chapter 10 verse 10, it says that by the which will you are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then verse 14 says, if you've been sanctified, you have been perfected forever. That is, that is too good to be true. And again, there's not very many Christians that believe that. I'm going to be teaching the, I'm just giving you an overview, but I'm going to be teaching these things in depth. And I promise you, if you could understand the things that I've already said, if you had full revelation of this, it would transform your relationship with God. It would keep you from being at arm's length, just believing that God exists and hoping that things would work out. It would allow you to enter into the Holy of Holies. It would allow you to have a relationship with God that most Christians don't even believe is available to them. So let me start here in Hebrews chapter 10. And again, I'm going to be going back and covering some things in more detail. But let me just show you some of these verses that if you understand what's being said right here, this is radical, radical stuff. Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 19, it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Again, most people do not have this boldness. And it's because of a sin consciousness. It's because they know that they haven't done everything right. And because of it, they, they don't doubt that God has the power. They don't doubt that God is almighty. Most of you that are here on a Thursday night, again, you don't doubt that Jesus heals people. You don't doubt that God can prosper people or you wouldn't be out here. You'd be at the, you know, the first church of the frigid air on Sunday. You wouldn't be here. You guys are fanatics. You believe that God does miracles. That's not the problem. But you know what the problem is? You don't have boldness to reach out and take it because your own heart condemns you that you aren't as holy as you should be. You aren't living as well as you should, and you know it. And because of it, you don't have boldness. You know, to illustrate this, I've seen lots of people raised from the dead. Matter of fact, we've got one guy, uh, Jim Baker, who's become a good friend of mine. This is not the one who went to jail, but a different Jim Baker. <laughs> and he pastors a church in Columbus, Ohio, and, and the guy's just awesome. And anyway, he heard me teaching on how I use my imagination and... Uh, because of it, I saw my son raised from the dead after my son had been dead for over four hours, between four and five hours. He was stripped naked in a freezer in a morgue. And they called us and Jamie and I prayed and he sat up and started talking and he's here someplace. He's probably here in the room. And he's the one that put up this screen and drove the truck here. That was back in 2001. And he rose from the dead after nearly five hours without any oxygen, with no brain damage. We said something right after he came back from the dead. And he said, there's no brain damage. And then he looked at us and he says, well, no more than before. 
So I've seen people raised from the dead and this Jim Baker, he, he's made a, a challenge to his people in his church and he calls it the Andrew Womack raising from the dead challenge. <laughs> and he tells them what I taught on imagination and he says, I challenge you to do what Andrew did. And did you know since they put out that challenge, they've had 16 people in his church raised from the dead. And yet this is what the Bible says all of us will do. You go preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. In the same way that you're supposed to preach the gospel, every one of you has raising from the dead power on the inside of you. And if you aren't seeing it function, it's not God's fault. It's our fault for not renewing our mind and taking advantage of it. See, we're supposed to have this kind of boldness. And so I believe that in raising the dead, you probably, when I talk about my son being raised from the dead, you say, well, I believe that. And if somebody was to die tonight and I said, well, praise God, how many of you believe that God can raise them from the dead? Most of you would be right there with me. And I say, I'm going to pray for this person and we're going to see him raised from the dead. Most of you'd clap and some of you'd get up here. You want to see it. But you know where I'd lose the majority of you? I say, all right, if you believe it, you come pray for him. And all of a sudden, you don't doubt that God can do it. You don't doubt that he'll do it through me. But when I say you come do it, all of a sudden, your faith turns to fear. Your excitement turns to dread. What happened? It's you don't have boldness to enter into the very presence of God. You, you don't feel qualified. You don't feel holy enough to have God use you. I guarantee you, God hasn't raise people from the dead through me because of my holiness. Matter of fact, the very first time I ever saw a person raised from the dead, it's a long story, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but when I saw this person raised from the dead, I thought, man, if you can see a person raised from the dead, you can do anything. And I took my eyes off of Jesus and got to thinking about, I'm awesome. <laughs> and it happened right before church. And so I went to church that night and told them about this guy being raised from the dead and then preached a message and it was not good. I bombed. <laughs> and I went home thinking, God, what's the deal? If you can see a person raised from the dead, how come I can't preach a good message and see things happen? And I actually went to bed that night disappointed. Like, God, what's wrong with me? God never uses anybody because they're qualified. God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. You got to get your eyes off of yourself. And this is what it's talking about, that you need to enter in. Uh, you have boldness to enter into the holiest. You know what this is describing? In the Old Testament tabernacle and in the temple, there was an outer court where anybody could come into. And then there was a brazen altar where you offered the sacrifice. That was symbolic of Jesus. And then there was an inner tabernacle that was divided into two parts. The first one was called the holy place and it had the showbread and the altar of incense and the candlestick. These things are described in the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews and 9th chapter. And then there was a veil that separated another portion and that was called the holy of holies and that's where God dwelt. That was the ark of the covenant and had the cherubims over it that protected it. And this is, man, this is one of the greatest things in the book of Hebrews is Hebrews chapter nine, verse five, where it says, we can't talk about the cherubs now. You know why? Because the cherubs were there to kill you if you entered in there. Nobody could approach into the presence of God. There was a separation from God. Isaiah chapter 59 uh, verses one and two, my arm, my ear isn't heavy that it cannot hear, nor my arm short that it cannot say, but your sins have separated between you and your God. And sad to say, most Christians live there still. They don't understand that when Jesus died, he was the veil. It goes on to say that. I'm going to read it here in just a minute. But Jesus' body was the veil. And when he died, the veil of the temple was rent in two so that we could enter boldly into the very presence of God. And if a cherub tried to keep you from accessing God, you could rebuke him. That's the boldness that we have to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And not very many Christians have that boldness. Their own heart condemns them and all you got to do is, all the devil's got to do is just show you something that you failed in 
And you don't doubt God's ability, but you doubt God's willingness to use His ability on your behalf because you don't feel worthy. That's Old Testament. Under the New Covenant, you are cleansed of all sin, past, present, and even sins you hadn't committed yet. Somebody's thinking, how in the world? Man, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just go back. Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. The moment he says by a new and living way, that makes the old way old. And this is exactly what he said in Hebrews chapter 8. When he said new, that meant the old is ready to vanish and pass away. Did you know the Old Testament law is not for a Christian? Now, there still is a purpose for the law for the non-Christian. It's to show you your sin and to make sin come alive and condemn you so that you would recognize you can't save yourself. You need a savior. So there is still a place for the Old Testament law, but not for the believer. The law isn't made for the believer. Man, again, if I have time, I'll get, deal with that in more detail. But there is a new and living way. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but I'm just saying it based on I've, I've been doing this for 56 years. I've talked to thousands and th hundreds of thousands of people, and there's not very many Christians that understand that there is a new way. They are still approaching God the way Old Testament saints did, not understanding fully what Jesus has done for us. But it says we now have a new and living way. When you say living, that implies that the old way was dead. And did you know that's the exact terminology? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7 says, it says that the old uh, covenant was a ministration of condemnation and of death. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 and 9, it calls it a ministration of death written and engraven in stones. In the new covenant, Jesus came to bring us life. We've got a new living way and many people haven't fully understood and because of it, they aren't taking advantage of this new covenant. So we have a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us that through the veil, that is to say his flesh. Again, this veil symbolized Jesus. And until Jesus died and his body was rent, there was a separation between us and God because of our sin. And if anybody tried to enter into that holy of holies, they'd be struck dead by the cherub. But now we have the body of Jesus broken for us. And when you sin as a Christian, I'm going to put this in balance. I can't say everything I want to say tonight, but I'm not encouraging sin. I'll deal with that later. But when you as a Christian sin, the veil doesn't get put back together and you're separated from God again. No, it was rent from the top to the bottom and it's rent and it's not repaired every time you sin. This veil doesn't come back and separate you from God again. If you truly understood that, that wouldn't free you to sin. It would free you from sin. It would free you from the guilt and the penalty of sin and it would set you free. So we have a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in, sure, in uh, full assurance of faith. Man, I could nearly spend an hour on every one of these words. Notice it says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance, not just assurance, but full assurance. Over in 1 John chapter 3, it says, and hereby we shall assure our hearts before him. Because if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. But brother, if our heart does not condemn us, then have we confidence towards God. Do you understand what he's saying? He says, you got to assure your heart. I talked to a person back here tonight who I was telling them certain things and they said, well, I know, but I don't feel it. And I told them, who cares how you feel? <laughs> we have glorified feelings today to where, well, I know the Bible says God loves me, but I don't feel it. Just pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. <laughs> See, this is what Dwayne's saying. I'll terrify you and he'll come along and edify you tomorrow. Amen and bless you. 
But really, people, well, you know, they say, well, I know that the Bible says I'm healed, but I don't feel healed. That's the problem. Feelings are more real to you than the Word of God. That's not faith. Feelings is carnal. If you are letting feelings dominate you, you are carnal and you walk as men and, you, and the carnal mind only produces death. You got to get to a place where I don't care what I feel like. The Word of God says I'm ill. And you just go to believing it. And you go to acting like it and you start acting on it. Man, that's awesome. So you got to get full assurance of faith. Not just faith. And not just assurance of faith, but a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Again, this, this goes back to what the whole book of Hebrews is about. The Old Testament saints, they offered sacrifices for every sin. They had a morning and evening sacrifice every single day. They had a sacrifice every time they sinned. They had a sacrifice on every new moon. They had a sacrifice on three major feast days. They had sacrifices every time you had a child. You had to have a sacrifice. They had sacrifices over and over and over and over and over. But it says over in chapter 9, around verse 9 or 10, it says that it could never make the person perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Also, chapter 10, verse 1 says the same thing. The Old Testament law couldn't purge your conscience. But the New Testament, it says Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, so that you should have no more conscience of sin. There's not one out of a, I, I was going to say 10,000, but I would suspect it's one out of a million Christians lives without sin consciousness. Matter of fact, most Christians believe that a sin conscious is actually healthy. They'll go around saying, I'm an old sinner, saved by grace. But they think it's healthy to just remember that you are a, you know, you're a dud, that you're no good. I think we need to remember that God saved us, not because of our goodness, but because of His goodness. We need to recognize that, but you do not need to have a sin consciousness. And yet most people do. Most people live with a sense of unworthiness. And it says that you have to have your, a full assurance and your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. I've actually got a book out there entitled, Who Told You That You Were Naked? And pe I've, I've had people call in before and say, I want that book on how to be naked. <laughs> That's not what that book is about. It's a quotation from Genesis chapter 3, verse 11, where the Lord spoke to Adam and Eve and said, Who told you that you were naked? The very fact that he asked means that God's not the one that told them, and the devil didn't tell them. You know what? They told them. When they ate of the tree, that's where they got a conscience. Either their conscience was already present, but it was dormant until they ate of the tree and that made it come alive, or the tree gave them a conscience. But they didn't have a conscience, a knowledge of right and wrong before they ate of the tree. But after they ate of the tree, every one of us got a conscience and it serves a purpose. It's to condemn you is the purpose of your conscience and to show you that you need a savior. And then before you get born again, this is what the law did. The law made your conscience come alive. The scripture talks about you can sear your conscience with a hot iron. First uh, Timothy chapter four, verse two. That means you can cauterize it to where you just lose feeling and you don't have any conscience at all. That's a terrible, terrible thing. You need a conscience to show you that what you've done is wrong and to condemn you, but you have to purge your conscience from dead works before you can serve a living God. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says that. And this is saying that when you enter into the holy of holies, you have to have a full assurance of faith and your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. And most of us don't. Most of us do not really understand how forgiven we are. And because of it, we just feel like we're forgiven to the point that maybe we can make it into heaven, but man, God, God may have pitied me, He may have forgiven me, and so that I can go to heaven when I die, but He certainly doesn't like me. 
And that's not true. God sees you. This is what my whole teaching that Mike advertised that book on spirit, soul, and body. God is a spirit. John 4, 24 says he's a spirit and he looks at you in the spirit and it's your spirit that was changed. And in the spirit, you are a totally brand new person and you have no sin in your spirit. And when you sin as a Christian, that sin affects your physical body and it affects your soul, but it doesn't affect your spirit. You retain that holiness and righteousness. You are righteous in the spirit. The moment you get born again, your spirit's as righteous as it will ever be. And because of that, when you worship him, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. Most New Testament Christians are not worshiping God in spirit. They're worshiping him in the flesh. And that's reflected when they come before God and say, oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm not the person I'm supposed to be. I fa the moment you start talking about what you've done, you're in the flesh. You've got to be in the spirit. And if you are born again, then in the spirit, you are a brand new person and you are as righteous and holy as Jesus is. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world, but so are we in this world. How can you understand that? It's not your physical body that's changed. It's not perfect yet. It's not your mind. It's in the process of being renewed, but there's not a person in here whose mind is perfect some of the ways that you're thinking about me right now is not perfect. <laughs> but in your spirit, you are brand new and you are as holy and pure as Jesus and you've got to approach Jesus on the basis of who you are in the spirit, not based on what you've done in the flesh. And see, if you understand all of these things I'm talking about, you would understand that Jesus made you a brand new person. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Your physical body didn't pass away and become new. Your mind and mental part has not passed away and become new. But in the spirit, you are completely brand new. In Ephesians 1, 13, the moment you believe, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, vacuum packed, so that when you sin, that sin will affect your body, it'll affect your soul, but it won't penetrate the seal around your spirit and you retain your righteousness and holiness in the sight of God. And that's what all of this is referring to, that you've got to come with a full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience to where you don't even have a consciousness of your sin. You're approaching God on the basis of what Jesus did instead of on the basis of what you've done. Man, I have preached more truth than most people will hear in a lifetime already tonight. Most people have not heard these things. If you could understand this, it would transform your life. So you have to approach in full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is talking about it's not only your spirit. Everything I've said about your spirit is true, but you aren't only spirit. You've also got a soul and a body and you need to keep that soul and body pure and not give Satan inroad into it. So there is a place for that and you need to have your bodies washed with pure water. The scripture says that you're clean through the word that I've spoken unto you, that you're washed by the word. In verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Man, we definitely are in the latter days of the last days and we are seeing the second coming of the Lord approaching and we ought to be provoking and fellowshipping together more than we ever have. And again, uh, there's so many things that have affected us today, but the way that we have access to news, to social media, to our cell phones and to all of this kind of stuff, Christians are more plugged into the world 
than they have ever been. There is more sewage of the world flowing through a Christian's mind and heart than probably any generation that has ever existed. And uh, we have to counter that by coming together and banding together and encouraging one another in church and things like this. This is why you need a good church. You need a godly church to go to. And I know that there's a lot of people that live off of my teaching or something, or you bootleg the gospel off of television and things like that. But you know what? You need somebody with skin on, not just somebody on the television. You need people that you can fellowship with that can input into your life. You need to be around people. And so... Anyway, that's just a real brief summary, I think, of most of what the book of Hebrews is talking about right there. Then in the 11th chapter, to prove it, it starts going through all of the heroes of the Old Testament and showing you that it wasn't their godly living that caused them to be accepted by God. It was their faith. It's called the Faith Hall of Fame, and it goes through and lists every single person. Noah is a person who God, uh, you know, said he was righteous in the sight of the Lord, but it wasn't because he did everything right. He got drunk after they got out of the ark and was uncovered and, and uh, wound up cursing his son. And you can go to Abraham. Abraham lied about his wife twice and was willing to let somebody else commit adultery with her to save his neck. And God saved uh, Sarah from having to go through with that. But I mean, Abraham wasn't the most holy guy around, and yet here he is, uses us an example of faith. And if you go through every one of these, Moses killed a man. He killed a man. Did you know that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible plus Psalms chapter 90? David killed a man, killed a, uh, her, his uh, mistress's husband trying to cover up his sin, and yet most of 1 Samuel was written about David. 2 Samuel was written, all of 2 Samuel. Most of first, uh, 2 Chronicles was written about him. He wrote all of the Psalms, or most of the Psalms, excuse me. And so he was a murderer. And then Paul came along. Paul was consenting unto people's death and arresting them. And he wrote half of the books of the New Testament. Do you realize that the Bible was written primarily by murderers? <laughs> And yet people somehow or another have missed this and think you got to be holy for God to use you. God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. It's amazing how most people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. They just believe things. But if you were to study the word, man, how in the world can you miss this? The Old Testament was a ministration of death, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, a ministration of condemnation, 2 Corinthians 3, 9. The law was, it strengthened sin, Romans chapter 7, I believe it's around verse 9. It strengthened sin, and on and on you could go with all these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 or 56 says, the strength of sin is the law. The Old Testament law strengthened sin. And it made sin come alive on the inside of you. I think that was Romans chapter 7, verse 9. It made sin come alive on the inside of you. Now, there was a purpose for all of that. It wasn't wrong, but it wasn't the best. There was a better covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 says that we have a better covenant established upon better promises. Man... We aren't taking advantage of what Jesus has done. Most people still have an Old Testament mentality under the condemnation and weight of sin. And because of it, they don't have an intimate relationship with God. They believe he exists. They call on him to get born again so that they won't go to hell. And they may have an assurance that they won't go to hell, but they aren't entering into the holy place. They aren't entering into the Holy of Holies. They don't have this intimate relationship with God because they just feel like, how could God ever love me or accept me? God doesn't love you because you're lovely. He loves you because he is love. And he loves you because he's made an ensoulment. And when you get born again, he makes you a brand new person. And he does love that brand new you. God is thrilled with who he made you to be. And yet most of us aren't thrilled because we don't know who we are. Most of us only know ourselves in the natural. We don't know who we are in the spirit. 
Those are awesome statements. And again, I know that some people think I'm preaching down at you and saying, you don't know these. I'm, I, you guys are exceptional. You're the cream of the crop. And yet most of you don't know this. I know it because I deal with I prayed with a hundred people tonight already or something. And I guarantee you the vast majority do not know who they are. And that's the reason that they're letting Satan run roughshod over them. And they come to me because they believe that I got pull with God, but they don't think they have pull with God. And so they come and they want somebody else to do for them what they can't do. And the truth is every one of us in the spirit realm, there's not a one of us that's different than the other. It is the spirit of his son sent into our hearts. And the only thing that is keeping you from accessing that is that we haven't renewed our minds. We don't understand what Jesus has done. And again, this is the whole point of the book of Hebrews is to get you out of the old covenant condemnation, knowledge of sin, feeling separated from God, trying to earn God's favor by all of the rituals and doing everything and get you to walking in the liberty or as Hebrews chapter four says, resting in what Jesus has done where you've ceased from your own labors. And it's not about you. It's all about what Jesus has done for you. Man, and this is the point of the book of Hebrews. And then chapter 12, after it talks about all these great heroes of faith, it says, now look unto Jesus the author and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him and endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. For consider him who endured such great contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you also be wearied and faint in your mind. And so the 12th chapter is just once again drawing you back to Jesus, a high priest of your faith. Did you know that when you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, most people think that that's just a religious cliche and they will end their prayer and they'll say, in Jesus' name, amen. But what you're actually doing when you say, in the name of Jesus, you're saying, not based on what I've done, not based on my goodness, not based on my performance, but based on Jesus, I believe that I receive. That's what we should be saying. But the average Christian, again, will say, God, I fasted, I've prayed, I studied the word, I'm paying my tithes, I go to church, I've done everything. Now, in the name of Jesus, heal me. You know what you did? You just took the name of Jesus in vain. You claimed that it was because of Jesus, but your actions, your prayer showed that you were really basing it on the fact that you thought you deserved it. And let me just say this in love again, but anybody who's ever been mad at God put out with God because you did better than you deserved. I mean, you, you, you deserved better than what you got. And you thought that God failed you. You were approaching God on the basis of your goodness. You thought it was your confession. You thought it was what you did. And God was obligated. God should have moved and he didn't. And that's the reason you're angry at God. You didn't approach him on the basis of Jesus. You were thinking it was based on your goodness and you thought you did better than this. You deserved better than what you've gotten. That's, that's strong, but that's true. And I've talked to a lot of people that talk about they were angry at God. Man, anybody who's angry at God does not understand the new covenant. You don't understand what Jesus has done and you are still basing it on yourself and thought you deserved better than this. And God failed. God has never failed. God is better to all of us than we have ever thought about him being. God is never the one who has failed us. We're the ones that fail him. And it's not always failing him through some sin. It's failing him because we are so sin conscious and focused on ourself and our inability that we are basing it on what we do. We say, God, I've fasted, I've prayed, I've done these things. Now will you move? That's wrong. If God gave us what we deserved, every one of us would go to hell. Every one of us. And somebody, well, not me. You don't know me. You know, the Bible says in Romans 14, 23, the last part of that verse says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Amen. 
Sin isn't only when you go out and break one of the big ten. But when you, when you fail to operate in faith, you're in sin. James 4.17 says, To him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So that means sin isn't only when you break a law, when you do something wrong, but sin is when you're supposed to be doing something good and you don't do it. If you're supposed to pray for other people and you don't do it, if you are supposed to read the word more and you don't do it, if you are supposed to love your wife the way that Christ loves the church and you don't do it, or, or reverence your husband the way the church reverences Christ and you don't do it, any failure in your life, not just a transgression, but when you fail to be the person you're supposed to be, that's sin. If you are going to try and approach God on your own, Satan will beat your brains out and condemn you and show you that you never deserve it. You never are worthy of anything. If we got what we deserved, every one of us would go to hell. You, the only way to have a successful relationship with God is to base your relationship with Him on what Jesus did and not on what you do. It's not what you do for Jesus, it's what Jesus did for you. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews is trying to draw you to, is to consider Jesus. Put your attention on Jesus and quit approaching God on the basis of your goodness. And quit being separated from God on the basis of your badness. Somebody will think what I'm saying is that, well, you're encouraging sin. No, I'm not. Sin will not, sin will not help you. It says in Romans 6, I'll be dealing with these things in a lot more detail, but in Romans 6, 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield to sin, you're yielding yourself to the author of sin, which is Satan. And John chapter 10, verse 10 says, the thief, Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. If you yield yourself to sin, you just yielded yourself to the devil and he is gonna steal, kill, and destroy. Now your spirit is sealed and it will still be righteous and holy. And since God is a spirit, he looks at you in the spirit and he still loves you, even though you're in sin. But if you're in sin, it's stupid because you are giving Satan total access to you. And yeah, your spirit may still be saved, but man, you just turn your life over to Satan. So God still loves you, stupid, but it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong for us to go live in sin. So if you're living in sin, quit it. But you can't ever approach God on the basis of your goodness. You got to constantly be basing your relationship with God on what Jesus has done. And tonight I've given you a real quick overview of the entire book of Hebrews. And I'll be going back and going into more detail and just amplifying on this. And I promise you, you need to understand these things. And again, Yes, we want to pray with you and we're going to give an invitation and we're going, to, we're going to have people pray with you and you can receive, but please go beyond just getting your body healed or getting a word from God that will take a little bit of discouragement away from you. Spend some time getting into the word of God and renewing your mind and learning who you are and what you have. And then when I'm gone or somebody else is gone, you can be able to minister to yourself. And that's what we need. We need people that mature and get to a place that you aren't living off of milk anymore, but you're eating the meat of the word and you aren't susceptible to the lies and the condemnation of the devil. Man, this will change your life if you'll receive it. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I've been talking primarily to Christians, but I've said enough here tonight that if you don't know Jesus personally, you could be born again. Because all of us have sinned, come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. But Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Somebody may think, well, I, I believe that there's a God. James chapter 2, verse 19 says, you believe that there's a God? 
You do well. The devils also believe in trembling. That's the most sarcastic statement in the whole Bible. <laughs> you believe there's a God? You hadn't done anything the devil hadn't done. The next verse says, but won't you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Just because you believe that there's a God doesn't mean you're saved. You've got to submit yourself. Romans 10, 9 says you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and then you shall be saved. So there is a commitment where you are making him Lord, not promising that you'll never mess up again because nobody can keep that promise, but you're saying, I want you to be my Lord. I turn my life over to you. I believe that you died for my sins and that now you are alive and that you're going to live in me. And there's a lot of people that acknowledge God, but that is not true salvation. You've got to commit yourself to him. So if you've never done that, you need to do that tonight. And then once you're born again, that's not all that there is to it. Jesus told his disciples who were born again, he says, don't go anywhere, don't do anything until you receive power from on high. And that happened in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues. So there is a second experience. Salvation, forgiveness of sins is absolutely essential but you also need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to live a victorious life. And some people think, well, I don't believe you have to have the Holy Spirit. Well, you don't have to receive the baptism. You can still go to heaven without it and you can get there quicker because you aren't going to have any power and you'll die of something along the way. But Jesus said you'd receive power, dunamis, miraculous, miracle working power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So even if you've been born again, but if you don't speak in tongues, it's like charging hell with a water pistol. You need power. And the biggest benefit of having the Holy Spirit in my life, there's many, many, many benefits, but probably the biggest results of having the Holy Spirit is He will bring all things to your remembrance. He will lead you into all truth. He will show you things. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. The Bible just came alive to me when I received the Holy Spirit. Same thing happened with Jamie. And I've heard many, many people say this, that the, the Holy Spirit's the one that wrote the Bible. He will tell you what it is. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a separate experience. And if somebody says, well, I'm not sure if I received that or not, you hadn't. Because <laughs> when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know that you got something that you didn't have before. So I'd like to give an invitation for those two things. If there's anybody here who maybe has acknowledged that God exists, but you haven't committed your life to him, you haven't received salvation, I'd like to give you an opportunity to receive. And if you have done that, but if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and don't speak in tongues, you need that. You need those two things to even get started. That is the foundation. That's the front door of salvation. You can't really prosper without those two things. Is there anybody here tonight who would say, I need one or both of those. I either need to commit my life to the Lord or I've already done that, but I've never received this baptism of the Holy Spirit and don't speak in tongues. If that's you, I'd like you to raise your hand where you are so I can pray with you. Just be bold right now. Put your hand up. I don't have a church for you to join. We aren't going to do anything. I'm wanting to help you and minister to you. Praise God. Man, we got people all over the auditorium. Praise God. I know somebody's thinking, man, I didn't know you spoke in tongues because I just sit there on television and I don't spit and say glory to God to and I don't wipe my fevered brow, and you didn't realize I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You came here under false pretenses. But I'm telling you, I do have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've spoken in tongues today. I speak in tongues all of the time. So whether you knew it or not, now you are in a holy roller meeting, and you're going to be criticized for coming here. You might as well get something for it, amen. I tell you, you don't... You need to come and receive this. It would change your life. So let me ask those of you who raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand, but you didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come down here and we, we want to pray with you and help you to receive. Thank you, Jesus.
Amen. We got people coming from all over the auditorium. Just face me right here. Just stand here in the front. I'm going to pray with you. Isn't this awesome? I know that there's some people that say, well, I'm not sure about this speaking in tongues. Well, I am. So if you aren't sure, you ought to trust somebody who is sure. I mean, I've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit probably 52, 53 years ago, maybe 56 years ago. And I tell you, it is an important part. And you need this ability to speak in tongues. When you speak in tongues, you're bypassing your brain. That's where the problem is. And the Bible says you're praying out of your spirit. So instead of praying out of your brain, which has confusion and wrong thinking in it, you're praying directly out of this born again spirit. Your sp it's your spirit praying. And man, it just releases power. It's really, really important that you receive this. You know, the Lord's speaking to me right now that there's people still sitting out there that you don't speak in tongues, but you aren't sure and you're just kind of watching and the Lord is saying that he's tugging at your heart. You know you should be coming down here, but you haven't done it. You need to get out of your seat and come forward right now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, you got nothing to lose. The worst thing that could happen is that you come down here, nothing happens, and I give you a free book. That's the worst thing that could happen to you. But you could come down here and if you'll believe and receive, man, you could just be set free. Let's squeeze in a little bit. We got some people in the aisles that haven't been able to come all the way down to the front. Praise God. Man, this is awesome. All right, the Bible says that before you can receive the Holy Spirit, you have to receive Jesus. It says Jesus is the one who fills people with the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive the giver before you receive the gift. So if there's anybody down here who has never truly committed your life to Jesus, I need to pray with you first. And you need to commit your heart to Jesus. Receive Him as your Savior because you can't receive the Holy Spirit until you receive Him as your Savior. Is there anybody who's not sure about that? You want to pray with me and just make sure that you're born again. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand so I can see who this is. Here's some right here. Three, four, five, six. Anybody else? Seven right here. Anybody else? Are you sure? You know, the Bible says that you get a witness in yourself and you know that you've passed from death unto life. If you aren't sure, you can make sure. Anybody else? Here's another one. Praise God. We got about maybe a dozen or so. I, what I'm going to do is lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to say words similar to what you need to say. It's not like magic. You just repeat these words and it works. You got to believe it. And, I'm, and if you will pray with me and mean this from your heart, then you will be born again. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made. And then verse 13 says, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man, isn't that great? It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus' sacrifice is greater than your sin. And if you will just pray with me and believe, you can be born again. So I want to ask everybody here tonight, if you would, to pray with me so that they won't feel like we're just listening to them. And if you've never meant this from your heart, if you've never prayed this and turned your life over and received salvation, then I want you to pray and believe and you will receive salvation. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Say, Father... I'm sorry for my sin. I believe that Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I believe that you died and now live in me. I am forgiven. 
I am saved. I am saved. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. 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 Do you know if you prayed that and, and believed it with your heart, then you are a changed person on the inside. Whether you feel like it or not, the Bible says that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you called on the name of the Lord in faith, you just got born again. Now, your body didn't change. If you were a man, you're still a man. If you were a woman, you're still a woman. I don't care what you feel like. I don't agree with all that stuff about you can just change your gender. You are still the same in the physical body that you were before. And did you know that your mental, emotional part didn't instantly change? You still got the same mind that you had. Now, you can renew it with the Word of God, but it's in your spirit that you got changed. And the Bible says that in your spirit, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This born-again part of you is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the significance of this is that God made you to be a temple for His Holy Spirit. He wants to live on the inside of you. So all you got to do, you don't have to beg Him. It says in Rome, uh, Luke eleven thirteen, 13, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? That's all you got to do is just ask. And if you will believe, He wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. That's what He made you for. Your spirit is a temple. So all you got to do is just open up the doors of your temple and say, Holy Spirit, come and fill me. And if you will do that, man, he wants to live in you more than you want him to live in you. And so you just open up and receive it. And then when they receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, they all spoke with tongues. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray for you real briefly, and I'm going to release the power of the Holy Spirit to come. It won't come unless you receive it, unless you make a draw on it. But if you believe and receive, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then those of us that have this gift of speaking in tongues, we're going to start speaking in tongues. Because the Bible says that when you speak in tongues, you give thanks well. So we're going to start thanking God for touching you. And as we start praying in tongues, you quit praying in English and start praying in tongues with us. And somebody says, how do you do that? I've got a book I'm going to give every one of you that will explain it in more detail. But if you're ready, you can receive right now. The only thing I'll say right now is that I asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I believed I received the very first time I asked. But I didn't speak in tongues immediately because I was mistaken thinking that the Holy Spirit would force me to speak in tongues. I just opened my mouth and waited on it to come out. And that's not what it says. The Bible says that they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. The Holy Spirit inspires it, but He doesn't speak in tongues for you. You have to, by faith, begin to start saying syllables that you don't understand what they are and believe that it's the Holy Spirit. And after you get to doing it, you'll find it just flows out of you and it'll be confirmed to you that it's the Holy Spirit that's inspiring it. But it's similar to when I preached tonight. If I would have said, oh God, you speak through me. Don't let it be me. I want it to be pure Holy Spirit. And then I just opened up my mouth and waited on God to make me talk. Nothing would have ever been said. I believe God spoke through me, but I was speaking. That's the reason it came out in Texan. It was me talking, but I believe that the Holy Spirit inspired it. It's you that speaks in tongues under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Everybody ready to receive now? The Bible says that believers will speak with new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer, I'm a believer. and I will speak in tongues. Father, I thank you for all of these, and I thank you especially for those who prayed and received Jesus as their Savior tonight. Father, I thank you for confirming that to them and just...